This, this is a paper I co-authored with Yorgos Yanakakis. The title is Boosting Computational Creativity with Human Interaction in Mixed Initiative Co-Creation Tasks. So pretty much what I'm going to be talking about is in the title. Um, we're going to be talking about computational creativity theories, um, merging them a bit more with human interaction. Um, and the uh, domain is mixed initiative co-creation tasks. Mixed initiative co-creation focuses around a design dialogue, a creative dialogue between a human, a proactive human creator and a proactive computational creator. The tasks themselves are related to games, so I'm going to be talking about some of my work in level design. Um, the reason why this, I consider this an interesting topic is because there's a lot of game editors out there. They're, they've been going strong for the last 10 years. They've allowed us to create games faster. They've allowed novices to make games within uh, the period of a game jam, a weekend. Um, they allow more people to engage in game development and they're generally uh, democratizing the process of game development. You don't have to be a software engineer, like Mark has said, in order to make games, and that's great. However, this would have been strengthened, this will be strengthened if we also add some AI to help you along the way, not just the user interface, but also improve what the computer can feed back to the um, user. So in enter mixed initiative design, which is not a new topic. It has been around since the 90s. It's a subtopic of human computer interaction. And Novik and Sudden back in 97 likened it to a creative dialogue between a human and a computer. And in this dialogue, the initiatives could be the task initiative. So who decides uh, what the topic of a dialogue is right in the beginning? Uh, what the speaker initiative is, so do we just take turns speaking, uttering phrases, can I interrupt you, can I go on a rant by myself, uh, and what the outcome initiative is. When do we finish the conversation? Um, who decides if we've reached a consensus and what that consensus is? So the main theme, let's wait for this to load, yoink, um, is that we need both a proactive human and a proactive computational initiative. And those don't have to be completely equal. You can have a computer leading the generative process and a human guiding it. This is the case for interactive evolution, for instance. Or you can have a human having the creative spark and the computer guiding, a, uh, guiding him or her along the way um, with suggestions. But ideally, what we want to get is this, which is a human and a computer having creative ideas of their own and then through a dialogue and through a process um, get into an, uh, get to make an artifact that you don't really, you can't really tell whose idea each of these um, components come from. So let's talk a little bit about computational creativity theory. Um, I am going to be focusing on three prevalent computational creativity theories in this field, uh, and I'm going to be adapting them slightly for uh, mixed initiative design tools. So first, let's start with Geraint Wiggins Subtuple, which describes exploratory systems. Here we have, a, um, we have a universe of all possible outcomes. The, that's the U. R are the rules which define what, a, uh, what membership of the conceptual space is. That means what constitutes a valid artifact of this genre. What is a valid um, jazz melody? What is a valid chess move? T are the rules of traversal, so how you explore this space. And E are the rules for evaluating the outcomes. So basically, even though we know that this is a valid chess move, is it a good chess move? Is it a good jazz melody? And that's E. Now, we um, normally, in a mixed initiative system, we kind of naturally assume that the human will be de facto the evaluator. Ultimately, they will decide what a good result is. This is especially true when we're dealing with interactive evolution, for instance. Um, however, human interfaces can also allow the user to affect traversal. This can be done directly. For example, in Pick Reader, there are some knobs that allow you to specify mutation rates. But it's a bit more interesting to do this um, indirectly by specifying, for instance, where you start exploration from. If you seed, let's say, evolution with a specific um, human design, then you specify which area of the search space you're going to be exploring. And that's also traversal. Um, humans can also affect the rules of what a valid output is by providing, for instance, an archetype of what they want to achieve. So they will specify the archetypical jazz melody, let's say. So the computer will figure out the way around it um, is the target. Very slow process. 
Um, I'd like to make a note here on conceptual space because I've mentioned it uh, twice now. The, it is the mental representation of what is a possible and an appropriate outcome is. Again, a valid jazz melody. However, we as humans um, don't exactly have hard rules on what a conceptual space is. Our conceptual spaces, our frames of mind, um, shift as we grow up, but also from external stimuli. A conversation with a colleague, a, uh, a long night's sleep, uh, an apple falling on your head, all of these can cause you to change your frame of mind, to change your ideas. And uh, I'm arguing that a computer stimulus that allows you to do that, that allows you to change your frame of mind, can actually lead to transformational creativity. Not of the computer necessarily, but of the human computer kind of hybrid, symbiote. Um, so even though the computer doesn't change what it considers to be a valid uh, conceptual space, the human does, and that's also important. Um, let's move on to another theory, um, that is Ritchie's criteria for um, f the final results, and that decides whether creativity has occurred. So these three criteria are novelty, so how dissimilar you are from um, existing examples of this genre, quality, how valuable this example is, and typicality, does this fit the conceptual space? Is this a valid jazz melody, for instance? Um, now, Rich's criteria are fairly general, and we could keep using them, and no one would um, have any problem with that. I'm, I'm going to try to specialize them just to take the user a bit more into account. So I'm adapting them uh, like so. So novelty is adapted for a mixed initiative tool um, into to what extent is the produced item dissimilar from what is currently created by the human user. We don't care about all the existing examples out there. We want to change the user's frame of mind. So we want it to create something that the user has not expected. Uh, quality is how valuable this is this to this particular user rather than uh, in general. And typicality is does this match the uh, human's um, frame, the human's uh, frame of mind. And again, this is important because different expertises, d different people have different frames of mind for the same topic. So for instance, I'm a, music, I'm a jazz newbie. My, frame of, uh, my conceptual space of what a valid jazz melody is is very different from a jazz musician, right? So the computer should provide me with something that um, fits that bill. Let's finally look at um, Simon Colton et al.'s uh, face model, which describes creative acts performed by software. FACE is an acronym uh, with F ac uh, standing for Framing Information, which is a textual, textual description that um, explains the creative process. A stands for the aesthetic evaluation, similar to E in uh, Grain Wiggins model. C stands for the concept, which is an executable program, which creates E, which is the expression, which is the single outcome, what we get out of it, the jazz melody, the level, etc. Each of these can be a singular instance or it can be a method for generating these instances, denoted with P. Uh, P. Um, now, normally we assume that the uh, human initiative, like I said before, will be acting as the ultimate evaluator. So it will be acting as the singular aesthetic that will be deciding what a, uh, whether they like this result or not, or whether this is a result they want. Um, however, we can also have um, the computer learning the user's aesthetics. And in this case, the computer is generating a lot of aesthetic evaluations and the human is guiding them towards their target aesthetic. Um, humans will always provide the framing information. That's because we naturally think of tasks like stories. We describe our everyday lives as a story. So we cannot stop humans describing their design process as a story. However, it would be great if the computer could also tell a story of why and how it has created something that will help with the dialogue paradigm. Um, and obviously the human and the machine affect the final outcome. Um, let's move a little bit forward, please. Right, so I'll be talking about um, some example tools, uh, mixed initiative tools and mixed initiative games um, that I've made over the years. Um, these are, not, are spanning the full spectrum between human-led creativity on this side and computer-led creativity with a human acting more like a guide on the other side. I'll be focusing on two tools in, uh, somewhere in the middle um, for, the, in, for the interest of brevity. The first one is Sentient World. Sentient World is a tool for um, designing game worlds, game terrain in particular. 
These can be used for role-playing games, etc. Um, the way this works is that the human starts by working on this low-level grid. This grid is nine by nine, uh, sorry, three by three tiles, and the user can specify whether it's water or land, or they can just leave it blank. Then the computer takes over, and they create these terrain, which are higher resolution versions of this terrain. And they're trying to obey the user provided patterns by applying back propagation. These are terrain generated from a neural network. Um, and it's trying to learn the patterns provided by the human. Uh, as you can see, though, it increases the resolution. This is a nine by nine, by nine grid. You can have um, hills, plains, and mountains. Um, so it's a more elaborate version of what the user initially provided. The human can then choose one of these. They can edit it further. And the computer, again, creates an even higher resolution. This one's 27 by 27. The process can go on and on until, you have, um, until you're happy, and then you can print it out into endless, an endless resolution height map. Um, this um, tool uses turn-taking speaker initiatives. While I'm editing, the computer does nothing. While the computer is learning, um, I'm doing nothing, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is also interesting is that um, each initiative has different tools at, at, at its disposal. I can change each tile individually, but I can only change a small number of tiles and only specify rough concepts like water or land. The computer can have more details and have more resolution, but on the other hand, because it's um, explaining this, uh, because it's describing this as a neural network, it can't actually change just one tile because neural networks usually will change an area around them. Um, the user specifies their target aesthetics in the form of the terrain here. Uh, but the computer has creative leeway because I'm specifying at maximum nine points here, but the computer has nine by nine, 80, uh, 81 points, sorry, 81 points uh, of which only nine are uh, human provided. So the rest of them, anything goes. Um, also, the specifics of is this a mountain or not are not uh, provided by the human. So um, uh, finally, the uh, human also affects traversal because they're providing the initial pattern. If the pattern is too complicated, then the computer, the back propagation might fail. It might create a partial pattern. It might create um, something that has a related but not uh, actually that pattern. So that allows the computer some creative leeway. Let's now look at Sendia Sketchbook, which is a tool I've made um, for quite a while now. I've been making, sorry. Right. So Sendia Sketchbook is a level design tool. It works on a very rough um, sketch of a level. It has a very, few, uh, a very small number of tiles, bases and resources, and impassable regions. Um, this is for a strategy game example. Um, it's really quick to make levels in Sandy and Sketchbook. Um, as you, on the side, as you, uh, as you draw, there are um, several metrics pertaining to the specific type of level, like resource safety, safe area, etc. And next to this are computer-generated solutions. Every time you add a new tile, then the, a new, new suggestions are provided. These suggestions are evolved from the user's current sketch, so it's evolution that is seeded from the user's current sketch. And um, they target, they optimize uh, each of these objectives, um, as well as um, they also, the other half of them optimize visual novelty. So they try, try to break patterns that exist in this sketch, and they try to create things that are different. You can see whether what things change when you select a suggestion, and you can also replace your own sketch with a computer-generated suggestion. And then you can edit it further, like I'm doing here. Um, after the user is uh, done, they can export it into a high-resolution map in several different formats, even as a dungeon. Um, and then they can also render it in 3D, which I'll spend some time navigating here, so it's not particularly interesting. Um, here we are. So in Sendian Sketchbook, the suggestions are always shown. Um, even if you don't um, choose them, um, they're, they're shown to you. So they act as random stimulus, even if you don't 
really feel they're interesting, you're, they're always there at the um, edge of your screen. Um, they can cause you to change your mind, change your frame of reference, even by just observing them. And they can change your mind as a game designer, um, because you might, or a level designer, because you might figure out that there are ways of achieving higher exploration um, using a different pattern than you, were, than you were using right now, but also as, a, um, as an artist, basically by breaking visual patterns um, like symmetry that we tend to create in strategy games. Um, these suggestions are seeded from the user sketch, so again, they affect traversal um, because you specify, we only evolve for five generations since we want to do it in real time. So you specify which area of the search space you're interested in by using user sketch. Value is ensured computationally via constraints because we make sure that all the suggestions are playable, also via the objectives. Uh, novelty is also ensured computationally through the novelty search mechanism. And finally, typicality is not really ensured, but honestly, with... Um, hello. Shouldn't be doing this. Um, honestly, with this very rough um, 8x8 grid and with small, this small number of tiles, any level you make will look like a sentient sketchbook level. So typicality is kind of ensured that way, indirectly. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about was uh, designer modeling, which is an addition I put into uh, Sendian Sketchbook um, in 2014. Basically, the computer is trying to learn what the user is doing. They can learn this by observing their style, which is a persistent model. Um, it learns from the entire history of your interactions, basically what suggestions you chose compared to what suggestions you ignored. Um, so if the suggestion you chose had a high exploration, higher exploration than all the other suggestions had, then you assume that you want more exploration, you increase that weight. Every time you load up Sendia Sketchbook, it will give you suggestions with more exploration. Um, the other uh, model is the model of process, which only looks at your current action. It's not persistent, it's only local. It looks at what your current action did to the past and to the present. So if your current action caused safety of resources to increase or it added more resources, then the suggestions will also target increasing um, safety of resources or increase the number of resources in the suggestions. And finally, the model of goals looks at the uh, map's appearance. Uh, and if it's symmetrical then, or almost symmetrical, then all the suggestions will match that symmetry. This is the example here. This level is almost symmetrical and we can see that all the suggestions have that particular symmetry. Therefore, we are, uh, the computer is learning the human's evaluation process. Um, ultimately, the user is still the evaluator because they choose whether they like a suggestion or not, right? But the computer is trying to learn and trying to match it and hopefully increase the number of times that the user checks out the suggestions. Um, again, in uh, the face model, the computer is acting as a generator of aesthetics. Each suggestion is a potential, uh, is, an is uh, created with a different generator of aesthetics and the human, human is guiding it along the way. Um, let's sum up. Basically, computational creativity in games um, has, there's a lot of fertile middle ground in between. I would argue that computer design has also some uh, say in that. There's very interesting things that we can do with computer design and computational creativity. That has already been, um, there's already talks in the main ICCC about this, but also considering game editors as one potential field of that. Um, it's ideal for increasing human and computer creativity. Small um, soapbox stand here is that we tend to focus on procedural content generation or computer design about increasing um, the throughput. How many levels can you make? You can make millions of levels, etc. But it also can help you be more creative, think about it more. Also, based on what Mark uh, was presenting before, think about the world rather than just getting a lot of data out there. Um, the human and the computer affect properties of um, computational creativity in the models that I uh, talked about before differently. Um, obviously, some are more tailored um, to human uh, input, some are more tailored to computer input. Um, and we should also consider the creativity of a symbiote, a human computer symbiote, rather than trying to figure out uh, where is this computational creativity addition, is this a human creativity addition? Uh, because ultimately, as I mentioned before, we, uh, the artifact, we can't really tell 
if the human had the idea or the computer had the idea. So it's not fair to figure out where the creativity comes from as well. And uh, just a small note on future work, we should definitely do more about generating framing information. This will be very important for computer design in particular because you have a computer there and you need to prove that it's creative to the user as they are editing. So um, having computer generated framing information will be really cool. That's pretty much it. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Clapping for my stuff. All right. Any questions? Mm. So you've got always seemingly the, the user, the human user is in charge. And um, so you say it generates aesthetics, but then the user ignores them. It generates uh, designs, then the user ignores them. Mm. And I wonder whether um, you, you talked about taking attention to sketchbook a little bit further and getting some people that insist mm. on going somewhere. And you have to live with that. And studying whether that actually helps. That will give you a good reason to implement the framing. Well, first of all, I think if we add framing information, because I've been thinking about this, obviously, but that's why I, um, I put it there, is that you cannot have as many, um, let's say, you would have a n different interface, right? You would only need one suggestion, one great suggestion, and then the computer insisting that this is a good suggestion. I don't know if we want to completely take away control of the, of the, from the user. They tend to not like that. Um, but at least if you can like, have a more elaborate description. This is the one suggestion that I think is important, and this is why. So you would have to be a bit more. You can't do this, obviously, for 12 suggestions shown on the side. Um, honestly, the mixed responsibility is more clear in Sentient World where you can, the computer basically created these and you can only edit them and that's again so that the computer feels, feels in control uh, but, um, but ultimately they're responsible for transforming this into a more uh, high resolution. Also even if you see this and you edit this, ultimately the, high res the, the infinite resolution terrain will still have artifacts that you haven't really figured out. However, again, like it's missing the framing information that you said. So it's definitely, like, if you have a more mixed responsibility or you know, more proactive or rather um, a, a more adamant uh, computational initiative, then you would definitely need to make sure that the user knows why this is a bad idea that he has and why your, the computer is a better one. Aaron. When I look at the bottom right, like those worlds all have very different like, semantics, right? Like I would uh, two over Mm. Right. Whereas, well, next to it, like you don't compare to that. It's like a landing spot. Right, right. Yeah. Does this have any semantic knowledge? Those kinds of right now, no, yeah. no. Okay. This so is only trying to. Make... Right. I mean, um, this is an interesting. I haven't even thought about this. Um, that might fit with in user annotations, for example. So it's trying to match patterns rather than trying to trying to work on terrain. Um, you could provide high-level patterns of a, of a purpose rather than of, like, I want this to be land, right? I want this to be lived in. I want this to be fortified. I, I mean, I'm fortress town. I don't know exactly how, but um, if it's something that someone needs to live in, then obviously it can't be an arid wasteland or, like, you know, a barren mountain, mount, mountain range, right? That would be, um, well, everything is framing, but yeah, that would be more like acceptable definition of framing. F land is framing, it's just not interesting, right? So, um, uh, yes, really cool idea. Matthew. Uh, so both in Sentient World and in Sketch, uh, the, the computer sort of has its sort of place and the, the human has its place. Have you looked into actually having Yes, I have, and I haven't done this because um, I think humans would not like it, but I have not, I, I've technically tried it, and that's why I have the repair function here, because 
if you, there, you should have an undo button. When you have a computer, especially one that you cannot prove yet, unfortunately, that it's you know, intelligent or creative enough, we're all getting there, but you, know, um, you should have at least an undo button so, or a you know, switch off button so that you can stop it from being disruptive. Especially to, so I found in Sandy's sketchbook that people use the computer towards the end but that was an informed choice. If you've spent, you know, let's say 10 minutes and then the computer just goes like, ah, I know how to fix this and like ruin your, uh, your entire 10 minutes of work. And this was why I, in sending a sketchbook, it, it takes 10 minutes to make a level at most. I had a much more elaborate um, generator that, would, that required like 30 minutes. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want intelligence there. You want, you, know, you want it in a safe spot hidden away. Like, uh, would you like to change this? And then like, if they really want to, they will. I don't, I mean, open to, uh, to experimentation, but I think from a UI perspective, you kind of want to at least give a hint to the player, that they're, to the user, that they're in control. So, you know, like at least tell them, you know what, try this, but if you don't like it, you know, you can turn it off. Um, how am I doing with time? It's 10.30. 10.30, great. So, any questions? No? Thank me. Thank <laughs> you.